Bruskov was very eclectic in his choices. I mean, he chose a great range of materials, but he also applied them in very unconventional ways. And so there are at least 12 materials used inside and outside the house, ranging from coal to glass marbles to rope to wood. And so this was where he was trying to be original. That was his art, was to take materials that other people found exhausted in their potential and apply his childlike imagination and find something else that these materials could do. Mrs. Ford was a painter and she wanted to exhibit artwork in the house and for Goff, the client in the domestic architecture was incredibly important because he saw them as individuals who had personality and character. And I think that the materials are an expression of that. Goff was in the Seabees, the naval engineers in the Aleutian Islands during the Second World War. And so he learned to be clever in the use of materials as he was building. And the Quonset huts were the things that they built quickly and used all over the world, but also in the Aleutians. Maybe Goff was not unaware of it, but that was hardly the leading motivation. It was its aesthetic impact that was the real driving reason for doing this. No one walking in here immediately thinks of Quonset hut rooms because his imagination has recontextualized them in a stunning way. And so when you think about it, the house is round because if you spin them in a circle to make them not like Quonset huts, you get a round plan. So it's, it isn't that he chose, I'm going to make a round house. It was the sequence of decision making beginning with a material, which is very much a way an architect works. Of course, this had its complications. It produces an extraordinary number of strange details. So there are also moments in the ceiling where there's rope, and then that has to hit coal and it has to hit a wooden ceiling. And so he's thinking about how all of those things come together. So that's also an example of where the materials are pushing the architecture forward in terms of new kinds of detailing. When it was under construction, the builder designed a sign for the front of the house, which listed his name. And then in a very large font, it says, we don't like your house either. And so the sign was actually already a commentary on the suburban context around, which was fairly repetitive and uniform in terms of the appearance of the house. You cannot isolate Goff in some arc of European-derived modernism. All you have to do is drive down Edgelon and realize, no, he's in this world. I mean, the fact that this house was published in Popular Mechanics and Life magazine, not high style, architectural journals is an indication of who Goff was. In fact, most of the press about Bruce Goff's work inside the Academy came out after he passed away in around 78. He was always, I think, an under-historicized figure. And I think part of the reason for that is simply because houses like the Ford House or the Bavinger House or some of the Garvey House, other houses, couldn't be placed in a history of architecture. Now, he's incredibly popular and we look at his work a lot and I think that now it has much more contemporary resonance for younger architects.